Welcome back, Night Owls. This is Dr. Nighttime, and I'm finally here to uh, give the overview of how you can derive Woolhouse's formula and get a more complete version of the formula than the one that appears in the tables in, uh, on the LTAM. So we start with something that might seem a little familiar if you remember your Calculus 2 and Series and Sequences, where you're trying to estimate an integral, or you either estimate an integral using a series, or estimate a series using an integral, right? either way. You've got this sum, right? And you're comparing that to the integral of that function. So, so suppose we had the function 1 over x plus 1, right? So I, when x is 0, I start at 1, then go down to a half, a third, a quarter, a fifth, right? So if I were to integrate that from 0 to 4, I'd get the natural log function, right? Because integral of 1 over x plus 1, well, it's ln of x plus 1, right? But that would get me ln 5 minus ln 1, right? ln 1 is just 0, so it's just going to be ln 5. With the calculator, we would get that to 1.6094. Okay, now let's compare that to just the sum of 1 over x plus 1 for those four numbers. That's this in blue. That area corresponds to the sum of 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4. And with the calculator, we get that's 2.0833. Same ballpark, but, but not exactly a good approximation. Now, one way of improving the approximation would be to take more and more rapid sums, right? Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do our Riemann summation, right? so that now, we are summing twice as often, right? We're doing 1 plus 1 and a half, or plus 1 over 1.5, plus 1 over 2, plus 1 over 2.5, etc., etc. Uh, but we have to divide by 2. Right? Uh, and we can view that geometrically that each of these red rectangles now only has width 1 half, hence the 1 half out front. So we crunch those together and get 1.8290. Now, Woolhouse's formula actually isn't used for estimating the integral of a function. Well, this formula is often used with annuity values where, so you can view an annuity as sums of the endowment function at various points in time. Or if you're compounding more than annually, uh, sums of appropriate fractions of the endowment function. The endowment function being uh, the present value of one dollar sometime in the future uh, contingent on you surviving that far. So the strategy with Woolhouse's formula actually isn't to estimate, it isn't to directly estimate either the sum, which would be the fully discrete uh, endowment function, or a fully discrete annuity, or the integral, which would be the fully continuous annuity. Rather, we want to say that if we, uh, so for each uh, compounding frequency, however frequently we want to uh, make the payments, we can use that frequency to estimate the curve. And based on the modifications we need to make between the, uh, the, the discrete version and the continuous version, that actually allows us to compare different discrete versions to each other. So it doesn't work when you're just summing normally and doing these, what I call rectangle rule of approximation, because all that would tell you is, well, they both approximate the same function, so they're not going to be too different from each other. That's the first term of Woolhouse's formula. That's just saying uh, a double dot x compounded monthly is approximately a double dot x compounded annually. Right? We never actually, I mean, there's no point in even using an approximation rule if you're just going to do that. Uh, that's why we have more than one term in our Woolhouse approximations. Second term in Woolhouse approximations corresponds to not the rectangular rule, but trapezoidal rule. If you remember trapezoidal rule, that means if I'm going to estimate my curve, rather than just picking my points and saying, well, I'm going to assume it's leveling off like this light blue curve is doing, you want to estimate what these diagonals are doing. So with the dark blues, I'm going diagonally down and with the reds, I'm going diagonally down, I'm just doing it twice as quickly. 
I have twice as many points. And so what I can do here for the uh, for the first one, and if I'm just compounding annually, well, I think about what do I snip off from this graph? And you can see I'm snipping off these triangles. The first one is width 1 half, height from here at 1 to the value at 2. Then 1 half for the width, and here at 1 to, sorry, oh, 1 for the width. It's, it's 1 half because it's a triangle. but uh, and then value at 2 compared to value at 3, then value at 3 compared to value at 4. So I can say, well, wait a minute, I know this is just going to be one half of the common width times the total height. So I can do that. I can subtract one half of 1 minus 1 fifth. This gets me 1.6833, a lot closer to the 1.6094 than what we had before. And for the reds, right, the triangles I'm snipping off, and I, I didn't draw them here because that would just be a little too much of an eyesore, but now those each have width one half instead of width one, which means when I divide by two again for one half width times height for area of a triangle, uh, those one halves turn into one quarters. The total change in height is still the same, I'm just subtracting off a one quarter here. And so because these two are supposed to be estimates of the same value, I could actually say well, can't I compare these initial values to each other by seeing what modification I need to make? So that's a true Trumbull house approximation. That explains the step ladder thing that I kept drawing uh, on the previous problems that I worked through. Now, what about three term Woolhouse house approximation? There, we need to account for the concavity of this function. Uh, we notice that two term approximates that we're just going down the straight line, but obviously if we're going down more rapidly earlier and more slowly later, we actually snip off a little more area. And that's generally true of the endowment function. The endowment function is pretty consistently decreasing, concave up, and leveling off at zero. Should even say positive decreasing, concave up, and leveling off at zero, but you know. Point being, it qualitatively looks like what I've been drawing this whole time in this, with this black curve. And so now we want to say, well, let's account for the fact that the slope at the end of our interval versus the slope at the start of our interval are quite the same. And for that, we need the following result, that this shaded area here is equal to 1 12th change in x squared, whatever my width is, squared, times the slope at the end minus the slope at the beginning. Notice that both slopes are negative, but I'm looking at the more mild negative and subtracting out the more extreme negative. So I still get a positive number here. And just to derive that, I can say, well, let's look at the simplest case of a function whose slope actually changes. Let's just do a parabola, a nice, easy parabola. Well, if I were to look at the difference between this diagonal curve and this parabola here, I'd get another parabola, right? Uh, quadratic minus linear equals quadratic. Uh, by symmetry, it would have to have its lowest point halfway in the middle. Uh, the slopes here, by symmetry, they'd have to be negatives of each other because parabolas are symmetrical. So this one would have to be f prime of 0 minus f prime delta x over 2. This one would be f prime delta x minus f prime of 0 over 2. Some algebra happens. I'm not going to make you listen to me talk about the algebra. If you want, just pause the video here for like a minute or so to read through it. But the upshot is that the y-coordinate of this point here, this being the difference between the diagonal and the parabola, it's going to be negative 1 eighth delta x times f prime of delta x minus f prime of 0. And using the 2 thirds, 1 third rule for parabolas, if this entire box is width times height, so delta x times this 1 eighth delta x times this difference in slopes, well, if 2 thirds is above the curve and 1 third is below the curve, 2 thirds of 1 eighth is 1 twelfth. So that gets us the 1 twelfth delta x squared times f prime delta x minus f prime zero. Once we account for that, so we know that our trapezoidal rule, our next approximation to that is to subtract off 1 12th 
of our width square for annual, that's just one. For semi-annual, that's uh, a quarter. For monthly, that's one over 144, but one twelfth of width square times change in slope between the beginning and the end. And looking back at our original curve here, And looking back at our original curve here, we know that if we wait way, way out into the future with the endowment function, uh, that slope is going to go to zero at the end, which means that our subtracting the slope at the end just goes to zero. That's why that doesn't appear in the version of the tables that they give you, right? Or the version of the formula they give you on the tables. You have, in the third term, you have stuff about mortality and interest at x. You don't have stuff off in the future, because if you're assuming a, a full life annuity, then those are going to be zero anyway. But more generally, uh, so if we apply this to our natural log example, right, we subtract 1 12th of 1 minus 1 over 25, right, the derivative of 1 over x plus 1 is going to be 1 over x plus 1 quantity squared and to the 1 over 25. Uh, so we subtract that off, we get 1.6033. For compounding uh, semi-annually, we subtract 1 48th of 1 minus 1 over 25, we get 1.6090. Starting to get pretty close to the actual value of continuous compounding at 1.6094. And so now, now that I've demonstrated this works pretty well, this three-term approximation, now let's use that to estimate the continuously compounded annuities, uh, both annually and monthly. So the annual one will be a double dot x colon angle n minus one half of one minus endowment function on x n years in the future minus one twelfth of the derivative with respect to t of, or with respect to time of uh, endowment function on x t years into the future. Uh, difference in those derivatives uh, between evaluation at n and zero. And the same thing compounded monthly. the only difference is we'll, uh, we'll start with the basic monthly, which we don't necessarily know, and instead of subtracting one half of this one minus endowment, we subtract one minus one, or sorry, we subtract minus one over two m. And this, instead of one over 12, will be one over 12 m squared. What remains is to figure out the derivative of the endowment function t years into the future. So since endowment function itself is what I've got here in gray, the endowment function itself t years into the future is survival function for t years times uh, t years of discount. We differentiate that with product rule. So we get negative delta e to the negative delta t s x of t plus e to the negative delta t times s prime at x of t. And we realize that since definition of mortality is negative s prime over s. If I factor out an e to the negative delta t times s, so discount times survival, then what I'm left with is negative delta minus uh, mu of x plus t. I also notice, so this thing I factored out, the e to the negative delta t times survival, well, that's just the endowment function again. So what I get is that these, uh, the, this term here that I'm subtracting with the derivatives, that's going to be just uh, endowment function times negative delta minus, uh, minus mu, minus mortality. Now, since I'm subtracting it, my minuses on the delta and the mu actually turn into pluses. But what that means is that in this third term here, I'll just plug this in here, uh, notice endowment function at zero is one because there's no discount and you didn't have an opportunity to die yet. So I leave off that uh, endowment zero years into the future because that's just one. So I have the delta plus mu of x minus 
n years of endowment times delta plus mu x plus n. Of course, if delta varies over the course of time, then yeah, you have to keep track of what the force of interest was uh, at different points in time. Uh, but yeah, that's a rather unusual detail. So upshot is that the version of the formula they have leaves off this endowment function uh, n years into the future here, and this endowment function n years into the future times uh, interest or force of interest plus mortality n years into the future. So if you did just want the formula to just commit to memory, this would be it. And if you actually wanted a walkthrough of the derivation, uh, the, the most difficult part, I'd say, is recognizing back here the uh, two-thirds, one-third rule and that this area that you're snipping off is one-twelfth delta x squared times difference in derivatives. That's the one least intuitive part. So that's the uh, Woolhouse formula derivation. And as always, if you like the way I explain things, click the link in the description. And until next time, this is Dr. Nighttime wishing you a good night.